everyone, Caroline Friday, Neighborhood Bible Study. We're continuing in our study of the Gospel of Matthew. We're in Chapter 5, discussing the Beatitudes. So we've set up, basically, a background of the Jewish Messiah and all the fulfillment of prophecy. And the Heavenly Father has laid out a beautiful case as to how He is the promised Messiah. He fulfilled so many scriptures. He, The timing in which He came the manner in which he came, the forerunner, John the Baptist, who was the promised Elijah. And we know that he came with tremendous healing. Everywhere he went, multitudes were healed. Um, and, and so all of these were signposts that Messiah had come, even to the point where his first four disciples he called, two sets of brothers were fishermen. And I believe that's a fulfillment of Ezekiel 47, where he told them, I will make you fishers of men. And we see the prophet Ezekiel had a vision of a great river that flowed from the throne of God, the river of life. And in that river were all manner of fish. And there were fishermen on either side of the banks bringing in these fish. These fish represent men from nations all over the world, men and women from nations from all over the world. And we know that's exactly what happened with the gospel. It was taken out to the entire planet, not just that known world at the time, but to the entire planet, the gospel has gone. And that is why I'm sitting here today teaching this, because someone took the gospel to eastern North Carolina and preached it to me, and I received it and believed it and, and endeavor to follow the Lord Jesus Christ and follow my Heavenly Father and walk in it. So we now are at the point where Jesus begins to teach his disciples about what this new kingdom is all about. We have to remember who the book was written to, the time in which it was written. This book was written before 70 AD, before the city was destroyed by Rome, the temple, and that whole system was destroyed by God. It's written to Jewish people who are under the law, under the Pharisaical rule, and have access to all the prophets and all the prophecies and the, the Torah and, and all those things that point to Jesus Christ. They're a shadow of Jesus Christ. Paul tells us that in the book of Romans. So let's look at Jesus' first teachings to his disciples. I think it's very important for us to look at this. So we're going to go to chapter 5 and begin reading. And seeing the multitudes, this is Jesus, he saw all the multitudes from uh, around him, from Galilee, from the Decapolis, and from Jerusalem, and from Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. He went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Not the poor, not the financially poor. The poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Okay, so when, when I look at this, uh, over the years when these scriptures have been taught to me in... Um, Sunday school, and all that. The great focus on these scriptures was me being poor, me um, falling on my knees and groveling before God, me um, weeping and mourning before Him, 
me being meek and lowly and letting people walk all over me, um, me hungering and thirsting after righteousness and never being able to obtain it. And there was this constant teaching and, and condemnation that basically said, you as a sinful person will never satisfy these requirements. These requirements that Jesus is laying out to his disciples. He's laying out the foundation for the kingdom of heaven. Who is, who are the people who will receive this kingdom? They're going to be these people described here. And the implication was all my life, this is what I was taught, is none of us are ever really going to fully satisfy these requirements. And you know, in a, in a way, that's true because um, we know on the other side of the cross, we have to be born again. We have to be born out of a sin nature into a new creation where God's Spirit is poured out into us and we become part of, part of the body of His Son. And we get a brand new nature. We become a new being, a new creation that never existed before. We become like Jesus. We're still human, but yet we're part of the divine nature. We partake of a, a, a part of the divine nature. We become part of God. I mean, that's that goes against most of the religious teaching that most of us have learned in North America. Most of the people in my generation, if you even suggest that you are like God, you are hailed a blasphemer. But let me tell you, it's in Scripture. Over and over again, you are the partaker of the divine nature. You are part of the body of Christ. You are seated with him at the right hand of God the Father. You know, Jesus told his disciples that, that the Father loves you because you loved me. And, um, and, uh, and on and on and on, you will see scriptures where God elevates the born-again child of God to the level of the divine. And we have to accept what God has said about us. See, that's the whole problem in religion. We have dumbed ourselves down and have believed the lie that we're still sinners, that we can never attain the position that Jesus Christ has. Well, you know what? He's the head of the body. We are part of the body and we take our place in the body. The little finger needs to be the little finger. The little toe needs to be the little toe. And it needs to operate as such. But it certainly should not forsake its obligation and grovel in condemnation and pity and sin thinking that it's less than worthy to be part of the body. That's ridiculous. That would be ridiculous for a part of our body to just decide, well, I'm not going to function anymore because I don't believe that I'm worthy to be a little finger. Well, that's just, again, crazy. Um, the little finger operates in the exact way that it was created. All of us have to operate in the way we have been created to be part of the body. And we're happiest and joyful when we take that position. Okay, so back to these scriptures. Jesus is laying out a foundation for this new kingdom. Who is going to be in this new kingdom? Who qualifies? Those who are poor in spirit. If you are rich in spirit, I believe what he's saying there, if you're rich in spirit, remember he's speaking to the Jewish people, You that means you are somebody who thinks you've got it all together. You believe that you're keeping the law. You believe that all of your conduct and all of your acts, all of your experiences prove that you're a good person, that you're a righteous person, and that therefore that qualifies you to be a child of God and for you to be pleasing to God. And the reality is no. The reality is those who will receive this kingdom are going to be those who realize, I can't keep the law. I am lacking something. And I want to know what that something is. I sense that I'm weak in my spirit. I sense that there is a weakness there and I need strength. And I can't get it on my own. Remember the rich young ruler? He came 
And um, the fact that he even came to Jesus indicates that he knew that there was something missing. He didn't have it all together, even though he claimed to have kept all the law in, in his boasting. He boasted and claimed that he kept all the law. But Jesus said, there's one thing you lack. One thing you lack. Sell everything you have. Give it to the poor and come and follow me. Well, we can't take that um, situation and say Jesus wants all of us to go sell all of our goods. But there was one thing he lacked. He lacked a desire and a hunger and um, a longing for what God had to offer. A righteousness that does not come by works or by keeping the law. A righteousness that comes by grace. And you receive it by faith. The hindrance had to be removed. What was the hindrance in that man's life? His finances. His finances. As long as he had his finances, he believed in that culture that he was uh, pleasing to the Lord. That everything was, was going fine. He was keeping all the law, and he was benefiting from it. You know, there are a lot of people today who are very financially well off. They believe it's because God is pleased with them, that they're doing everything right. And as long as they're financially blessed, um, then there's no need for them to desire anything else. And, you know, sometimes the Heavenly Father has to step in and intervene and wake some of us up. I, that, I've had that happen to me. Wake some of us up and make us realize, you know what, your righteous acts will not get you anywhere. They are like filthy rags before a holy God. You've got to receive righteousness that comes from a different place. It comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. It is not based on any of your conduct any of your natural abilities, any of your lineage or who you're married to or what your last name is, any of that, none of that matters. Okay, so the people who came to Jesus, I believe he's looking at these multitudes. These are people who are the outcast of the Jewish community. They were rejected. They were sick. You know, in that culture, if you were sick, that meant you had done something. You had sinned. You had done something wrong. You, were, you had been cursed by God. So they were desperate. There was no place for them to go. The temple could not help them. The Levitical priest could not help them. They were the rejects of society. They were poor in spirit. They hungered after something greater than what existed at that time, what was being offered. And so they qualify. They are poor in spirit. They mourn. They long for redemption. They long for the things, the promises they saw in the word. The promises that were given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Where were those promises? They couldn't get any of that because they had been rejected. They saw that the temple system did not offer any of those things. They mourned. There was a cry in their heart. You know, there's some people right now who aren't getting fed by their churches or by their religion. There's a cry in their heart for that something more. What is it? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the grace that he offers, the free gift of God's righteousness that comes by faith. You receive it by faith. You don't receive it by any of your good works. And so those who um, are meek, what does it mean to be meek? That means that you put yourself lower than God. You, you come under what God has to say and you submit to what God has to say. You don't become a doormat for people. You don't allow people to hurt you. But you do subject yourself to what God has said. And God has said Righteousness comes by Jesus Christ. And you set aside all the other things um, that you've been told before, all the righteousness that comes by your good deeds. You set all that aside and you reject it. And you receive what God has offered. And, um, 
and there's a hunger and a thirst. You know, I will tell you right now, for me, I was hungry and thirsty for this. And the people I've known throughout my walk with the Lord that really began in 2000, fall of 2000, the people I know who have stuck with this, who have really stuck with it, are people who are hungry and thirsty to know God, to really know him and to walk in the fullness that Jesus died to give them. Those are the people who will grit it out and dig in and will not give up when there is every reason in the world to give up. The kingdom is for the earth for these people. Um, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Okay, there is a spirit of mercy that is on the person who is born again, who has received this. Not only a hunger for righteousness, a hunger to know God, but there's going to be a spirit of mercy, not a spirit of wrath and condemnation. Um, there's going to be a purity of heart. There's going to be a soft, pliable heart. God calls this the circumcision of the heart. When you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, there's a circumcision of the heart. The hard, stony heart that is so common amongst religious people. These are the Christians that point their finger, wag their finger, call down hell and brimstone and fire and brimstone on people for various sins. Those people have hard, stony hearts. That's what the law does. The law makes people hard and inflexible proud, blind. They're not hungry for the things of God. They're not meek. Um, they're not merciful. Okay? So they're not going to receive the heaven, uh, the, the, uh, the kingdom of heaven that's being offered. And, um, and they're going to be peacemakers. They're going to desire peace with all of mankind. Now, they will not compromise truth. We don't want to um, just step aside and not be confrontational because we desire peace and then forsake truth. We don't want to do that. We want to uphold truth, but we want to do it in a peaceful, loving way. And really, the only way one can do that is to do it by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has to show us how to do that because in our flesh, we can get angry and mad and wrathful. And, um, and so we have to do it by the Spirit. And then lastly, we'll just, there's going to be persecution. Religious people are going to persecute this whole system of the of um, of this kingdom of God that is received in a very different way from the way it was received under the Mosaic Levitical system. There's going to be great persecution, and we know that was true historically. It still exists today. There are denominational religious people who persecute and come after anybody who wants to stand firm on the purity of the gospel which Paul preached. It was the gospel of grace. It was the gospel that righteousness comes by faith. It's the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ received by faith, not by works. So there is going to be a persecution. and But there's a blessing that comes along with that. And then I believe he turns to his disciples and specifically says to them that, um, that there was going to be a specific persecution for them where they would be killed, that men would revile them, would kill them, and, um, but great would be their reward in heaven because the prophets of old, even John the Baptist, the prophets of old were persecuted in the same way. And we know there are people in the world right now, Christians in the world, who are preaching the gospel, who are being persecuted by religion. And they're being killed. And they're um, being reviled because they uphold the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. This was specific to the disciples of that day, of this time, but we know it also exists today. So this is a blueprint for the individual who will receive the promised Messiah. And we know that the disciples, they met this definition. 
any of us who have been born again, if you are a born again child of God, I bet you could look at this blueprint and you could go through all the different um, elements here that are laid out and you can say, yep, that, that was me. That was me in uh, 2001. That was me. I was crying out to God. I was hungry for him. I had brought myself down to a place where I could not make my life what I knew it was supposed to be. And yes, I was persecuted for it by my family. And yes, this is exactly who I was. And when I cried out to God, and when he answered the call, and I received the Lord Jesus Christ by faith, then a change happened. I became born again, and I could begin to see, when I look back, I can begin to see changes happening in my life. And so, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. This gospel is the same gospel today as it was back when Jesus was walking the earth. The same elements have to be present for an individual to receive Jesus Christ. It is not about praying a prayer and it's not about being dunked in a, in a big pool of water. It's not about joining a church and doing good and righteous things that, that gets you into the kingdom of God. All those things are fine, but there has to be a poverty of spirit. There has to be a meekness. There has to be a mourning, a cry within you. There has to be this hungering for righteousness and um, this purity of heart, this desire for peace. And then there will be persecution. All these things should be present. If you look at your life right now and you say, well, you know what, I don't really see those things being present in my life. I don't know if I really am born again. I think I'm relying on the fact that I went to church all my life or that my grandmother talked about Jesus and I talked about Jesus and and I think Jesus is pretty cool but I don't really see a significant change in my life. Well, don't despair. Don't beat yourself up. Just receive him by faith. Just say, Jesus, I want you. I want to receive this gift. I receive it now. You are my Lord. I believe that you died and you were raised back up. And I believe in your heart you did it for me. And make it a sincere cry of your heart. And your life will change. But we see this blueprint right here. It will never, ever be altered. Anyone who comes to him is going to satisfy this blueprint. And um, we're going to go on and read just a few more things that he says um, in this chapter. This is verse 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth. So the person who meets these requirements, who um, received the Lord Jesus Christ, gets born again, receives the kingdom of heaven, this person is going to become the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot of men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick. And it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Okay, we're going to stop right there. But remember, again, he's talking to Jewish people. He's talking to the, the lineal descendants of Abraham, um, the lineal descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he's telling them, you have been called to be the salt of the earth. You are the ones who God has designated would bring this message to the whole world. But if you've lost your saltiness, if you've lost your savoring 
a savory taste. If you've lost all the properties that salt has, we know that salt is used for curing, for healing, for preservation, um, lots of different things. Um, but if, it, if you cease to become that which you were designed to be, then what good are you? You are called to be the light of the world. You are called to be that light that, that brings in the nations to this message, that brings them into the kingdom. But if you take your light and you shine and you put it under a bushel so that it doesn't shine forth, what good is it? So I believe he was speaking to the nation, this lineal physical nation and saying and telling them, you have a calling, you have a purpose as the nation of Israel. You are not called just to be an island unto yourself, a city unto yourself, where you're just this um, um, you're very secluded from the rest of the world. No, you have a purpose. Your purpose is to bring, bring the nations into the fold. Call them in. Have them come into the kingdom. And we know under the Levitical Mosaic system where the law was the governing institution and there was so much condemnation and lack of mercy and and cold stony hard-heartedness that was never going to happen nations will not be brought into that they didn't even want the nations being brought into that that was not the purpose of god for them to become a nation that was a nation unto themselves and everyone else excluded no it was to be a nation a kingdom of priests that would bring the light of God to all of mankind. And we know that's exactly what the gospel is. The gospel is for anyone who will receive it by faith. That is the calling of those who are born again. It's not your calling to sit in a church and just be around a few little Christians and live a quiet little life. I believe God has called all of us who are born again to be that salt of the earth, to be that light that shines forth, and call the nations in. Start small. Start in your neighborhood. Start in your family. Start in your school and your workplace. And allow the saltiness, the wonderful savory taste of this gospel to flavor the uh, world around you, your sphere of influence. Be that light in a dark place. Be that, you know, a light doesn't just um, uh, burn everybody. A light is a small flicker, but what it does is it draws people in. And it does it in a very powerful way, but in a very gentle way. And so we see that nothing has changed from the time Jesus presented this kingdom of God, this kingdom of heaven, to, to Israel, to his disciples. The same blueprint exist today as it did then so we want to make sure that we are not operating like the pharisees like the, the the religious israelites of the day who reject what god is offering and insist on being under the law when we are under the law in that way we have lost our saltiness we have put our light under a bushel and he's not going to be pleased with that and you won't be either. You'll be miserable. You'll be a miserable, miserable Christian. Get that bushel off your light. Uh, step out and um, uh, let all of your behavior and all of your words be flavored with the saltiness, with the savory taste of God's word and God's truth. And watch your world change around you. Things will begin to change for you. And so um, we want to continue to meditate on this. I will tell you for me, I, I often examine my life. I often look, have I put my light under a bushel? Are there some areas that the Lord wants me to step out in and let my light shine? And um, are there some people I need to share the gospel? Do I need to um, flavor my words in a way that they will be brought in? 
You know, the Heavenly Father will show you what to do. The Holy Spirit will lead and guide you. We don't want to dump a whole bunch of salt uh, on our words. We know what that's like. You can't eat it. We don't want to take a torch, um, a blowtorch, and blast everybody with our, our words. But we want to do it in a way that will bring people in. And I love the fact that... Um, that Jesus lays this out so beautifully. And next time when we look, we're going to see um, some of the correction he makes to the law and the way the um, nation of Israel had interpreted some of the laws that were given. They had interpreted a lot of these laws in a very literal way, but there's a spiritual element. There's a spiritual heart element to all of these laws. Jesus makes these corrections and... Um, by receiving these corrections, we come to realize, wow, you know what? I don't know if I can keep that law. If if murder really is hatred in the heart, all of us have murdered. If to adultery is lusting with the eyes, then all of us have committed adultery. Wow. I need a savior. I need someone who will help me in these areas. So we'll look at that next time. All this is fascinating. It should make all of us excited about being born again. It should make all of us be thrilled that we no longer are under this heavy burden of having to keep the law constantly and to always be worried about whether God loves us. Is he mad at us? Is he angry? No, he's not mad. He's not angry. He loves you. He does not see the sin anymore. He only sees his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He only sees the righteousness, the everlasting righteousness that was ushered in when this new covenant was instituted and the church was born. So we have to remind ourselves of this constantly. I do. And we have to remove the religious denominational teaching that wants to bring us right back under the law. And that just brings death. So meditate on this. Don't trust me. Go look for yourself. Test what you hear in the pulpit of your church and in your Sunday school class with the Word. And challenge your teacher in a loving way. Ask your teacher, why are you teaching this when the Bible says that? So all of us have to do this, and it's godly, it's biblical. So we'll look at more of Matthew next time. Have a blessed day, and I'll, I'll be seeing you soon. Have a blessed day.